All right. We are going to hand this over to you. And uh, uh, Bosha, great pleasure to have you here. Uh, as I said, you know, Moshe is the CTO of uh, Firebolt, which is this massive, fast uh, uh, analytics company, uh, very much focused on low latency queries. But he's also really well known for inventing MDX, which gets used as this meta layer, the semantic layer on top of uh, this type of queue processing that we've looked at with things like star schema and uh, stuff like that. So, uh, Bosha, real pleasure to have you. And uh, looking forward to hearing your talk. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for the kind words. Uh, the pleasure is all mine. Like CMU database talks are legendary, known all over the world. I myself watched a lot of those lectures, even knowing a little bit about databases and still learn. So thank you for hosting me here. So uh, since it seems like this and last week you're learning about transactions, I thought it would be interesting to talk about how we handle transactions in Firebolt. So a uh, couple of thoughts about Firebolt. It is a data warehouse, it is analytic system, but it's tuned for the data intensive applications, meaning applications that require very high throughput, hundreds if not thousands of QPS, and very low latency, you know, tens of milliseconds. And that might not sound like a lot, like single Postgres not probably can handle it for LTP workloads, but here we're talking about analytical sizes, tens or hundreds of terabytes. So this is what Firebolt is for. And uh, today I want to talk about how we build our transaction manager. And again, some of the concepts we're going to talk about should be familiar for you from the previous and this class. But since it's very different system from what you're learning, they applied also very, very differently. And hopefully this will be interesting. So let's start with our requirements. This is the list, and then the list is going to come up in a second. So first, we're talking about transactions has to be asset, and uh, let, let's talk about each letter a little bit separately. So the I isolation level is the most interesting one. There are a lot of different isolation levels. Being an analytic system, kind of the standard way to do to go is a snapshot isolation. And we kind of thought, okay, if we're doing snapshot isolation, why not also do serializable snapshot isolation? Because it's kind of easy to extend. Uh, but it's um, full practical applications. You know, the snapshot isolation is the standard. The methods that we use also should be familiar to you. Optimistic concurrency control and multiversion concurrency control. But with a twist, we put slightly more meaning into letter O in the word optimistic, and I'll talk about it. And for the multi-version concurrency control, remember we're talking with a lot of data, hundreds of terabytes, petabytes. So to put MVCC metadata into each tuple, like, you know, when which transaction it was created and which transaction was deleted, is not very practical. It's not going to scale well. So by using um, annotating MVCC metadata at more coarse granularity, in you know, data warehouses, there are updates are usually batches, or even mini batches. So we attach it to the entire batch rather than to each individual tuple. Of course, you can still do mutations on single row, but that's not something data warehouses excel at. We have immediate consistency, not eventual consistency, because we're a real database. So once a write committed, all thousands of nodes in our system, next read should be see all the changes immediately. Uh, we don't have division to write and read replicas. Uh, every node in our system can write any data provided that they have permissions to do so, of course. Um, as we said, the data volumes are really big here, so uh, have to account for that. We also cannot play trick like all oh, that's shared by database because we support cross database transactions. And on top of all that, we are low latency system. So the transaction overhead should be around one millisecond. You know, if the whole query is 10 milliseconds, that's already 10% of the budget. So we actually have tricks uh, to go down to zero, even below, but I don't think I'll have time to talk about this. Okay, so we covered letter I. Also covered C, although strong consistency is not the same C as an asset, but uh, let's squint on it. 
let's also talk about A. So how do we get atomicity? This is exactly what you just talked in the class using Kaita headlock. Now, when you have record that transaction committed, that's kind of fact of writing this record is the atomic operation that makes transaction visible. The letter D is um, also interesting here. How do we get durability? So being cloud data warehouse, we store all of our user data in object store, such as S3, which is the most durable system in the world. I forgot how many nines it have, but like more than Pi probably. Uh, but what about metadata? How do we make uh, right ahead log and other metadata durable? So you just talk about, oh, you need to flush to disk and so on. So we, do, we, we don't store it on disk. We store it in another database. And uh, we're using Foundation DB as the database to keep track of our transaction log and all other metadata. And Foundation DB is kind of simple key value store. It doesn't have a lot of features, but it's battle tested. It's super reliable and it's super low latency. It's still latency is amazing, better than anything else we tested. Um, so you see, it's kind of funny. So we're building database using another database. Actually, Foundation DB uses SQLite as its storage engine, so its database is all the way down. Okay, let me walk you through uh, kind of how the system works, so you'll get a little bit of taste, um, you know, how we build this. So we're starting with DML transaction, and I'm using insert here, so it adds new data. But I could have just as easily used delete to update because when you use object store such as S3 to store all the data, it's immutable. You know, unlike you know local SSD disk, or you cannot actually change anything. So inserts obviously appends, but deletes also appends. So what we append is a bitmap or roaring bitmap showing uh, which records were deleted. And update is delete plus insert, so would be two appends, okay? Anyway, let's talk about insert. It's a little bit simpler. So there is new data in the system. We store it in a stream. Oops. We make record in our log that we have this uh, new tablet. Then let's say two more transactions came in into one continuous to write into table A. Maybe it's the same transaction, actually. Another one writes into a different table. So also write it in transaction log and so on. Okay, so we upload data into S3, we make record of it, um, it's atomic, and at some point those transactions will commit, and that's when everything will become visible. Now, to support strong consistency, of course, every time there is a new query, it seems like, you know, we really need to go to our transaction manager and ask what is the state of the system, and with thousands of nodes, it's not going to scale. So we use um, log replication. And our solution to log replication is use Kafka, which is you know, another very reliable and, um, and good system for this kind of things, like broadcast, not a lot of amount of data, but broadcast to a lot of subscribers. So we pretty much publish things from our right ahead log. Uh, but Kafka or any other such system it's like asynchronous replication, so maybe not all events got into it. We don't depend on it for correctness. Remember, we are not eventual consistent system, but we depend on it for performance. So this is how this optimization works. We publish the log into Kafka. Anybody can look on it. Let's say this not looked on it. Say, oh, I see event that something changed about table A. And table A is very important to me. I see that users query it a lot. So let's go and prefetch this new data that was added. So this is kind of additional optimistic thing uh, that I talked about. Another twist is that we actually publish those log records before transaction commits committed. So maybe transaction is still running, but we start prefetching data. We don't violate isolations. Queries don't see this data. This pure performance optimization. But we're optimistic in a sense we hope that most transactions will succeed, that they will not roll back. If they will roll back, so we did this prefetching and maybe, you know, a uh, couple of tablets and we did it for nothing. But optimistically, you know, if it will succeed, we'll have it ready. So we move on on this log and 
we should table B, maybe it's not interesting for us, we ignore, walk us over, and now the select query comes, and we say, great, we already have all the data cached, we can, you know, answer it from the local disk very fast, we don't need to go to HT, right? Well, of course, wrong, because our transaction actually had three tablets, and here we only saw two, and I promised you that we're going to have strong consistency. So really, before the select can start working, we have to go back to our transaction manager and ask, what is the current snapshot? And when snapshot isolation, like what is the current state, like after the last transaction commit? Okay, so it looks like we need to go back to the transaction manager. And since we support cross database transactions, like this log can have a lot of entities unrelated to our query. And we would need to scan all of it and replay. This can be slow. So in my example, I only have one entry which is unrelated, but maybe, I don't know, we're doing massive uh, batch ingest for some completely different database and the log is polluted. So the solution as usual in databases is to build index. And we build multiple indexes over our right ahead log, which is kind of, sounds a little bit unorthodox, but on the other hand, uh, also natural. So say, if we want to access the log by table, if we're only interested in the state of the table, let's index by it. So now we can go to this index, do index scan, see that, you know, we already have T1 and T2, we only need to fetch T4 from the from S3, and we can do our query. So we can fetch it in parallel with starting um, running over the existing ones. Okay, I think I'm at the time. There's still a lot of things I didn't talk about. There are, of course, the real system is much more interesting. The kind of how you mask uh, all this transaction overhead and uh, how you deal with uh, scalable snapshot compactions. Many, many other subjects, which I would love to talk about, but I only have 10 minutes, so I'm going to stop now. Thank you, Moshe. That was excellent and right on point with everything we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. And I know you tailored this talk for the class, so huge thank you for that. Uh, I, uh, questions, class? I have one. Uh, it's fascinating that you use this index structure for the write-ahead log. Uh, obviously, it has to be fast, especially on the appends. Can you tell a little bit about what type of index data structure do you use for indexing the wall? Sure. So we use Foundation GB, which doesn't have any native indexes. It's really key value store. So index in Foundation GB is just come up with a clever scheme for keys. And every time you write something, you write it twice into the log and into the index. But the key for index starts with stable ID. Because the Got only it. type of queries Foundation GB supports is range queries. Got it. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. That was fascinating. Thank you again. Thank you.